Robert Stevens. I'm an architect based in Mumbai. I moved to the city in 2007 uh, to join RMA Architects, uh, and I've been working with RMA since then. I'm currently a principal at the firm. Uh, when I joined 15 years ago, I was an apprentice. And uh, in addition, of course, to architecture, I'm very passionate about art, about history. And, uh, you know, I've been fortunate to, to end books and to have many of these interests kind of collide, interconnect over the last few years. Beautiful. So that's been quite a journey for you, of course. Uh, and uh, you've been here 15 years and we've also been connected with RMA on several projects and it's just an absolute pleasure connecting with you on this. So I would like to begin the conversation by asking you about the process of a book coming out. You know, what was the seed of this idea and how did you go about uh, bringing it to life through uh, a number of years? So just take yeah. me through your process on this. Yeah, sure. So it was, uh, I'll begin by saying it was very organic. Um, not much of this was pre-planned, um, and I think fortunately so. Um, you know, it, it began in 2013 as kind of this fascination, this curiosity. Um, I, I stumbled upon a plan for a 400-acre park at Ma Lakshmi, and it just it set me thinking. This this plan was from the 1860s, and this set me thinking: what else, you know, is there? Could there have been um, in the city's urban history? And, uh, you know, it was in many ways a balance. Um, you know, one, the, the work life that I had at RMA uh, is very intense and, and we're fortunate to have a lot of projects at any given time under construction. This was kind of a counterpoint to that. Um, it was a balance, it was the unbuilt, it was ideas, um, sometimes very radical ideas. So. You know, I would I would spend kind of my time in the train before office, my time in the train after office, thinking about about uh, you know about projects, about where to search for projects, um, uh, ideas, plans that were unbuilt, and you know it just it kind of grew as a destination, like kind of like a fire. It just kind of kept growing, and then our son was born. Um, so that <laughs> that kind of doused the fire for a couple of years um, and just priorities changed. Uh, but it was that was a that was a great experience because I had accumulated a lot of research, uh, you know, on the city, which it was just pure research and facts and, and statistics kind of after, you know, after life slowly started to, to become predictable again, um, I combined this research and this kind of very new playful quality of life, which I saw in our son. And, and that's when the writing of the book began. And that also coincided with the pandemic. So I had all of a sudden, what, what was before bookended with train journeys, which weren't necessarily conducive to writing, of course, but it was conducive to thinking. Now I had these bookends to my day where I could write. Um, so that's that's when the pandemic is when all this research started taking a very kind of functional form in the terms of a written book. Um, and we started, of course, designing, uh, which I'll share more about the team. Um, but yeah, that's that's very broadly. That's the, the structure of how it has happened. And, uh, you know, that's why I say it's organic. It's not been something, you know, this year I'm going to do this, this year I'm going this. Different phases lent themselves to different kinds of expression. I don't imagine any other way, honestly, except uh, organic, you know, for such a, uh, such a massive uh, work volume base. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, Robert, the first project that you display in the book is from 1670, uh, yeah. which is uh, nearly coinciding with when the Portuguese left behind seven discarded packets uh, for the, you know, for the British to take over. Yeah. And the last one is 2020. That's a 350 year gap, right? Yeah. So uh, what are the uh, what are the factors that you took into consideration while forming this sort of temporal uh, bracket? And did you, you know, plan to move around, uh, sh shrink it or expand it uh, during any point? Yeah. So I, I set for myself two criteria uh, when selecting projects. Um, one was the the ideas, the plan should be interesting. Um, there should be something genuinely interesting about them. I think not necessarily that I liked the idea or disliked it. I just thought there should be something, you know, novel about it. Um, the second 
and I, I think in some ways more important criteria was the, the plan should lead me into a, a field of research and history that I would not have gone to otherwise. Um, and that was really, really, uh, that was really fun because, you know, I'll give you one example. Um, Deku prepared, a uh, Bombay-based firm, prepared a hostel design in the, I think, early 2000s. Um, and that led me to research the history of hostels in Bombay. You know, like I would have never woken up and said, let's research, you know, hostel life and facilities for students, you know, in the mega city. Um, and, you know, as expected, though, once I started, it's it's a really fascinating, tumultuous history, uh, you know, with with um, a lot of holes in it in many ways, uh, insufficiencies. So every project that, that, you know, one was, of course, the timeline, but it was this combination of being genuinely an interesting idea, plus leading to other discoveries, which one would not have had otherwise. Uh, so in the introduction to the book, uh, you're describing the task of imagining or reimagining Bombay as both Herculean and Sisyphean. So yep. at least I can imagine in terms of scale. Uh, but when you say Sisyphean, does yep. you know a part of the myth come in? Yeah, totally. Um, you know, it's uh, it's it's interesting. Uh, I'll start. I'll start. Go back to that. The project kind of sparked the book, the four hundred acre park at Mahalakshmi. Um, Arthur Crawford called that the Bombay Park. Okay, and it's it's you know of course it's roughly where the Mahalakshmi race course is now, the Willington Sports Club. Um, so that was eighteen sixty, if I recall correctly, eighteen sixty. Nine. 1865, oh, I think. 1865, yes. 1865. The park. So I'm, I was re really just at that part. Uh, <laughs> point uh, the architect said that, you know, even London wouldn't have such a park that yeah. Mahalakshmi like would. Exactly. So, so that's 1865. Fast forward uh, to the, again, the early 2000s. Aditya, Aditya Thakare proposes a huge public park, again, on the race course grounds where the Wellington Sports Club is, that area. Um, and he calls it the Mumbai Park, right? And his his had shrunk. It was I think 226 acres, but it's like it's like this myth of Sisyphus. No, you keep pushing this idea up a hill, you get somewhere, and then it just comes tumbling back down, and you try again. So you know, one sees this in many projects, and this was nice because their ideas, Crawford's and Aditya Thakare's ideas, are basically the same, just the exception. Bomb has become Mumbai. <laughs> you know, like it, it's a very uh, a very local story in that sense. Um, so, yeah, you you see these constant ideas, these constant aspirations that people keep pushing for, but uh, they just keep tumbling back down time and again across centuries. That's a beautiful analogy. I must say this. Uh, so, uh, moving to the next question, I would say that the projects, uh, you know, as you stated in the introduction the 200 unbuilt projects, they're clubbed under various categories according to uh, function. And those include uh, commercial, residential, housing, ports, uh, even deep end sanitation, especially, yeah. uh, you know. So apart from utility, was there another basis to this distinction? And, you know, you're using uh, Kabuzia's architectural polychromy, which is very interesting to me uh, in this sense. So did you think that they, they, the book could do with lesser uh, you know, distinctions in this or more of them to make it more expansive? Yeah, yeah. So the goal was to make it expansive. Um, and I, I'll just kind of, you know, it, it's it's my hope is that these, what I, I call them typologies, they're basically functions, right? What are the functions each project fulfills? I think I've deliberately not, um, for this edition, to had a preface or an introduction by someone else. Um, because I wanted people with different interests to be able to read it as they want without being kind of uh, led in a particular direction. Um, and I just, I'll, I'll share why that's meaningful to me. Um, for example, in <clears throat> uh, 1963, P.G. Patankar prepares, prepares an underground railway plan for Bombay, right? So the function for that is, of course, transportation, and then on that railway, but it also falls under defense. And you would think like, you know, why, you know, what's the relevance of that? Um, and 
And Patankar argues this is about two decades uh, after World War II. He says, you know, underground railways are, um, the stations themselves are places of refuge should, you know, an urban population come under attack. And, you know, when I put this in the book, I, I thought to myself, like, what a useless idea. You know, nobody in the 21st century is going to be hiding in underground, uh, you know, metro stations from an aerial bomb bombardment. And then you look at the last, you know, 50, 45, 50 days in Ukraine, you have hundreds of thousands of people, you know, fleeing, uh, you know, taking refuge in underground stations. And I just thought like, you know, he was exactly right. Um, you know, Patankar was bang on that one just doesn't know how history will lead, what the future will bring. And that was a potential safety net for an urban population. Um, and so that was the defense, right? That was the defense component of what was otherwise a transportation plan. Um, so it's just, you know, I think time and context, both present and past, give different readings to different projects. Um, and and that's, this is something I am experiencing now, which has been quite fun after having, you know, released the book. So there's also a lot of uh, overlaps between, you know, these purposes. So I think the more expansive uh, uh, these functions got, I think you could uh, go ahead defining these uh, yeah. segregations much better. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, an observation that I made going through the book, in the first 100 projects at least, 60 to 70 percent deal with either sanitation or uh, ports and everybody who has been to Bombay even once or lived live in the city for some time knows that the city has a very special almost love-hate relationship with the water so I would like yeah. you to uh, you know shed some light on that yeah it's um, an interesting one of the the pool quotes in the book is uh, it's for a project for um, for a dock and the the author of that quote says, there's so much talk in Bombay about docks that people must be sick of it by now. And I just, I love that because like, you know, I can't, I don't think in 15 years I've ever, you know, been in a meeting or met someone and we're talking about docks, right? Um, so it was, it was a really interesting era in the, the city's history this time where, like you've said, sanitation projects and um, these docks and piers, infrastructure for shipping you know facilities um are at the forefront and you know this is something i think that makes bombay really unique uh, i i read a couple of years when really i'm enjoying i've been and continue to enjoy never built new york um, it's a similar very similar concept i learned a lot from their book in in producing bombay imagined but one sees the majority of projects are buildings Right, you know, they're skyscrapers, these very elaborate cultural facilities. And this is one of the things I think that makes Bombay unique is for, you know, for, for nearly a century, forget buildings, we were struggling with basic sewage networks <laughs> um, and still struggle today. It's, you know, it's a, it's a complete mess. Many things have grown ad hoc and continue uh, to do so. Um, so, yeah, it's just, it's, it was a really interesting time where the best minds of the city, we're, we're focused on, you know, sanitation, dealing with the city's waste and, you know, port infrastructure. Um, and, you know, today we're disconnected from the water, but I think, you know, at, at the time when these projects were at the forefront, everyone was involved with the water in some way, although not from a recreation point of view, right? It was commercial, um, you know, either everyone or someone they knew was, you know, relying on waterborne trade for their livelihood. So uh, yeah, it was, it's an interesting set of projects and there's a lot of emotion in how people describe them, critique them and advance them. Uh, so it's a fun, a fun kind of season in the history of Bombay. Uh, so do you also think that there's a direct correlation with uh, a number of these projects being heavily concentrated towards the south, because Bombay, although does have a very extensive shoreline towards the west, the south is where it really, uh, you know, uh, is led to fruition, especially near the Kolaba area. Uh, yep. Do you think that is the case? Yeah, so there were a couple of people who tried to break out of that. Um, they tried to put docks at Trombe, 
Uh, they tried to put docks in the middle, the very middle of the city. Uh, again, at Mahalakshmi today, kind of the low-lying area of the city, and they failed. They just failed because there was too much. There was too much existing infrastructure, too much density of population in the south, and it was it was almost like this black hole that nobody could escape the gravity of uh, the urban gravity. Um, uh, even though even though a few like kind of very radical thinkers tried. So just the sheer gravity kept everything to the south. And it was just very slowly, once there was no space, you see this gradual northward shift, uh, especially along the eastern waterfront. So the beauty, I think, of such unbuilt projects, of which we also have you know, plenty of, mm -hmm. uh, is that they sort of watch over what was built as a phantom. That's, what, that's a personal belief that's coming to you. You know, so, yeah. so what is built in Bombay is sort of defined by what was not built. So it's a very sure. dynamic relationship and almost an equilibrium. You know, what are your comments on that? Yeah, totally right. Um, so each each chapter in the book, there's basically 200 stories, chapters, whatever one would like to call them. Um, I, I would like to think they balance this, this dialogue, right? So, you know, one... One is describing, sharing about these ideas, but always counterbalancing it with what actually happened. I'll give you one example. There was, uh, you know, there's a, there was a plan for Dharavi, uh, this grand master plan for Dharavi. And the idea behind it was, let's develop this master plan, but only after we finish um, uh, housing for mill workers, for lower income groups at, um, at Worldly. Right, the BDD Chols, which are now uh, now crumbling, but they were built in the 1920s, and this this idea that we're going to take up Dharavi, the Dharavi Master Plan after these Chols are built is what did the Dharavi Plan under, because they ended up taking too long, and by that point the Dharavi population had grown and nobody was willing to budge when talk of a master plan came up, so. Now, when I see the BDD Chols, you know, I don't just see them in isolation as, you know, these standalone blocks that were built for workers' housing. They were part of this whole ecology and this, this kind of imagined timeline for the city's growth that, like a domino, they had this domino effect that because they were built in the time they were, they stopped something else, actually. They led to the, the, the stoppage of another idea. So a lot of interesting interconnections come up. Uh, you know, I think through reading, through reading the different stories. Yeah. Part of the reason that I was so interested in this project was to actually read about what they planned for Dharavi, because we know yeah. what came of it, but what was planned is, leads a very different dimension to all of it, especially having read Rahul's extensive work on documenting the Chawls is just been uh, such a visual journey. Yeah. Yeah. And so, I think there, there've been about five plans for Dharavi. Um, I think the first, if I'm not mistaken, is 1920. So we're looking at a century of, of ideas. Um, and the first, when the first plan comes up, there were, I think they said, maybe a couple dozen huts on the land that was Dharavi. You know, it was basically unpopulated. Uh, so yeah, it's an interesting, interesting micro narrative in the book. Mm -hmm. Right. Personally, I haven't lived in Bombay, but I have a very different notion of the city. But I also think that the book found a very special resonance with me in that sense. I think that's the shared uh, dismay of uh, um, an urban planning failure and the congestion that both of these cities deal with on a very different level. Yeah. Uh, you think that sort of appeal uh, was the idea of Bombay Imagine or is this just a narrative on only Bombay? The thing, I think what we've missed in, and I say we, meaning as the architecture community by and large, we've missed in writing about the built environment, we've missed the emotional and the personal history. Um, we talk a lot about buildings themselves. We talk a lot about styles, uh, but I think the, the lived experiences of, of creators, of planners, of architects, of, of lay people who are passionately involved in the built environment, I think we've missed that narrative. And the book, uh, it, it really, each story has, I would like to think, great focus on the people behind these ideas and the emotions they felt and, and sometimes the emotions they received in, in response. 
And because of that, I think a lot of a lot of individuals can relate and, and are relating uh, to the stories because they can see themselves in these these struggles, these battles. Um, and yeah, I think that's the thread that kind of goes beyond the specific geography and, and makes it accessible and relatable to a wider audience. Some of the proposals in the book, let's, I think we can face it, were pretty ludicrous in that sense. You know, I am particularly reminded of one uh, where this gentleman was digging long lengths of canals and there was a sort of a merry-go-round structure that was shoveling uh, water and taking it to the uh, edge of the city, you know. So as I, as an architect and as a theorist in that field, how difficult was it to not inject your personal opinion uh, onto this? Yeah, yeah. Fortunately, I, I don't think anyone wants to hear what I have to say. So I, <laughs> I kept my opinion out of it. Um, no, I think, I genuinely think all people are good critics um, uh, in their heart. Um, and, and I didn't want to be the one criticizing, you know, other people's plans for individuals. Um, and that's why I started with, I would select projects if they were interesting. I think Samuel Perk's idea to drain Bombay, you know, to create this sewage network with Ferris wheels on the east and west that would, you know, flush the city's sewage network and then flush sewage out to sea. That's just interesting. It's fascinating. Um, you know, his, his own critics at the time said this was the most, I think their exact words were, it's the most ludicrous plan for the drainage of any city ever in the whole world. Um, and that's, again, that's just fascinating. Um, and it showed, it showed, you know, I think the idea, as crazy as it was, and as something as visually repulsive as it would have been, what it tells me is the city's sewage problems were so bad and so challenging that these were the types of solutions born out of that. Um, and, and I think, you know, not many people will understand the challenges of draining a city like Bombay, which is in many districts, you know, below sea level. These are our, our kind of pure scientific uh, problems. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, I, I think we learn a lot, even through projects we wouldn't necessarily resonate with visually. Yeah, I think you're, uh, you know, this, that's a way of different way of looking at this. But your comment on every, everybody being sort of a critic at heart certainly makes me uh, feel better about my job. So <laughs> <laughs> good. Uh, so you state that there are three fates that a number of these unbuilt projects were met with. And one of them was, and in most of the cases, that is true, uh, to be bureaucracy. You know, the papers were buried somewhere, the government didn't have budgets, and, you know, there were multiple processes in line that sort of held up these projects. Right. Do you think that has changed today? No. <laughs> Bureaucracy will always be, uh, I think, possibly the number one um, uh, hindrance to, to ideas seeing life. Um, yeah, come what may, bureaucracy will be there, I think. So what do you think Bombay's current urban aspirations are? That's a really complicated question because there are many different types of people with different types of aspirations, right? So there's no one answer, right? You have, you have the official aspirations, right? Which would be put forth by BMC, by MCGM, <clears throat> which are focused on by and large big projects, right? The coastal road, the underground Metro, the Trans Harbor Sea Link, right? These are, are very large aspirations. And again, I won't give my own opinions on these. They are what they are. These are, are the official aspirations. Then I think you have the aspirations of common citizens, people like myself, right? I have very simple, uh, and, and I'll say like a working professional, right? I have very simple aspirations. I would like to be able to take the office in a comfortable and easy manner. I can't do that. Um, the trains, you know, are still as loaded as ever. Um, uh, crossing, crossing, uh, you know, uh, very dense intersections is still a risky uh, exercise that, you know, one has to be fully alert uh, so as to not get uh, uh, 
uh, into trouble per se. Um, so that's so those are like very practical aspirations for me as a working professional. Then I think you'll have aspirations of what I'll say families, right? Aspirations for parks, for playgrounds, for places to recreate. Um, and those I think is where the city, not now I'll give my opinion. I think those are where the city is most lacking um, because, you know, children, young adults are the most underrepresented perhaps in government, right? You, you don't see anyone in government standing up and shouting, you know, we're going to double the amount of children's parks in the city in the next, uh, before the next election, right? You see flyovers, you see coastal roads, sea links. Um, so that's why there's, there's multiple aspirations and unfortunately they, they don't synergize, right? There, there's not a, a synergy um, that's healthy, unfortunately, but this is, this is what it is from my perspective. So coming to our present period, so moving towards the end of the book, I think uh, there are a number of uh, projects from existing practices that you're able to document. Uh, you know, how, so how was it interacting to these architects and learning about their aspirations and you know pitching these projects? Because you could not just have ready material from them, you could also interact with them on a one-to-one -one basis. So how was that uh, yeah. part of the process? Yeah. That was really, really fantastic. I'll give you one example. Um, I wrote to, uh, this would have been, I think, around 2020. This was early in the pandemic. I wrote to Jacob and McFarlane Studio in Paris. And, you know, I said, I've discovered your Ambedkar Memorial proposal uh, at Dadar. And I would like to feature it in a book about architecture and urban planning history of Bombay. And within, it must have been within, in three hours, I got a phone call with a Paris pin code. I picked it up. It was the principal, Brendan McFarlane, one of the principals of the firm. And he was just, he was super excited. And he started telling me all about the project, the design. He had made many trips to, multiple trips to Bombay to present uh, the, the competition proposal. And, you know, he was just, he was fully, fully um, committed still to the idea, even though, you know, they, they were officially uh, first runner up, uh, but he was still fully committed. And he called back the next day and said, Oh, I forgot this. I want to tell you also about this, this, and this aspect of the design. Um, so that I was, I was really touched by that. I think that commitment really impressed me. Uh, it's an interesting, you know, it's, it's hard to work. I think in Bombay when you're in another country, uh, it takes a certain amount of trust and commitment. And I'm sorry to say it, but I think by and large, we have not met our side of the deal. <laughs> um, you know, because there there's so many variables at play in a project being realized that when you're sitting, you know, in Europe or in the U.S., you just have no clue. Like Stephen Hall's proposal for the, the Baudajilad North Wing extension Again, beautiful design, very sculptural. Uh, the the jury called it calligraphic. Um, he would have no. He would have never imagined that this building would get stopped in its tracks because it was proposed on a playground, and the MNS was vehemently against this pro this playground being partly compromised. You know, like he would have had no clue. Um, so it's just you know it's a it's a really complex environment that we work in here. And I think competing from abroad is, uh, is, 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 uh, it's rife with challenges, I'd say. Yeah, there's always a different, you know, uh, layer of uh, a socio-economical, socio-political challenges that people, you know, coming from outside may not be aware of. Absolutely. So again, coming, coming as an outsider, I feel that Bombay has a certain degree of uh, romanticization associated with it. And that's been through the ages. It's not just the films. It's just that the city, it's, it's, it's very hard for me to put it tangibly, honestly. Uh, so do you think that sort of romanticization had a role to play in the ultimate fate of these 200 projects? Yeah, I think the romanticization is, is just a very, again, I think it's a very natural and organic, which is why it's hard to describe it. it it's something I'm kind of glad we've, we've never tried to make it in the city. Um, it is what it is. And unfortunately, I think that's 
I think now with many of the projects being built in the city, that romanticization is being grossly diminished, I would say. Um, and uh, uh, maybe next time you visit, let me know your, your impressions, because it's just the, the scale and nature of new, new components of the built environment, um, they're not romantic by and large. <laughs> Um, they, they just have a whole different feel uh, to them um, compared to what, you know, one has seen either in films or even, you know, 10 years ago. Uh, it's a very different built environment now. Um, and I think a, a great loss for the city.